everybody. This is Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series uh, between authors, between writers, between novelists, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, mostly novelists. Sometimes I, I get non-novelists here, but mostly novelists. Um, and it's always a good time. Uh, it's always... <laughs> I never know what direction it's going to go. I do very little research because I'm lazy. And also, that I like the spontaneity of the conversation. I like to pretend it's um, like I'm meeting these people at a cocktail party, and and I want to know everything about them. Uh, so it's you know I don't really prep many, if any, <laughs> questions. Um, and you know I'll know a little bit about them. They'll have been either pitched to me or I reached out to them, um, and I know as much as what I can find on uh, their website, Wikipedia, that kind of a thing. But otherwise, I like to go in pretty pretty uh, empty knowledge if that's a term um and and i think that makes it more in- it makes it more interesting for me <laughs> so if it doesn't make it more interesting for you i'm sorry uh but that's the way i roll um and today i had a fantastic conversation today i talked to author uh, heather levy um who is just wonderful we <laughs> you know it, it went maybe it went a little bit long that's my own fault because i wanted to keep talking um but she was really interesting to talk to so Basically, she's a uh, born and bred Oklahoman, um, and she went to um, she got her, an MFA from Oklahoma City University's Red Earth MFA program, uh, and she took some time uh, before getting her first novel done because of life and kids and all that good stuff. But then she did get her first novel done, and it got um, a glowing review in uh, the New York Times, and uh, it got nominated for an Anthony Award, which is fantastic. And then she's following it up with her um, with her secondary book, which is coming out in February 2024. It's called Hurt for Me, and it's um, it's, it's 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 a glorious cover. Um, I'm very excited about this. Uh, she writes she writes dark stuff. She writes uh, kink positive stuff, um, and uh, she's uh, she's she's a fantastic storyteller. And she writes stuff that, that her agent was like, I don't know how we're going to sell this. This is a tough book to sell. Um, but, you know, when you write dark stuff, it usually finds an audience. Um, and especially if you approach it from a place of emotional honesty um, and, you know, and, you, and if you have compelling c- characters who are relatable, it doesn't matter what you're writing about, people are going to gravitate towards it. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen with Hurt For Me when it comes out in February. So, um, but her journey was very interesting. And I think, you know, if you're an aspiring writer, it's interesting to hear kind of the trials and tribulations she went through, particularly finding an agent, which is no, um, no easy thing to do, no matter what approach you have or what book you've written, it's always difficult. Um, and then she's starting to see success. So it's fantastic. And, um, I think you're going to get a lot of out of this one. So I hope you enjoy it. I know I did. This is my conversation with Heather Levy. Perfect. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh, good. I was like, I was frantically trying to fix a sprinkler in my backyard and then rushing in here, and then of course none of the the tech was working. So I I hope you can hear me okay. The mic wasn't working. The yeah. house wasn't working. <laughs> yeah, I could totally hear you. I, I was kind of dealing with the same thing. I had to steal my son's um, mic, his headphones. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, oh crap, mine's not working. <laughs> so. it's, and it's always like you have it like perfect. Like I have it perfectly set. There's like no yeah. de- deviation necessary. And then sometimes it just doesn't work and it just is and it's always that one time when it's just like oh i only have three minutes left (laughs) so but but we're here we're good uh where are you where do you live oh you're oklahoma Oklahoma. i'm in oklahoma city yeah i'm like right in the heart of the city too okay okay born and bred right born and bred yeah i'm i'm a i'm a city gal um but i i have uh i have two older siblings who grew up in very small, a very small town in Oklahoma. So okay. I used to visit them there. So I got, I got the taste. A lot of people with, with what I write, um, especially, well, with my first book, yeah. they're like, oh, so you, you've lived in, you're, you're like rural Oklahoma. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah. But I know it. <laughs> yeah. And so in Oklahoma City, I don't so I don't know much uh about Oklahoma. So even though I'm in Colorado, I'm not super far away. <laughs> well, I mean, I same for me for yeah. Colorado. I mean yeah. I've I've visited certain yeah. places, but it's like I, I have no idea. <laughs> How big is Oklahoma City? It's pretty big. I mean, yeah. we're spread out. Yeah. Um you know, it's a uh, it. We've got our main metro area, but every it's not a walkable city. We have a lot of people who are trying to, yeah, like local legislators who are trying to make it more walkable. Sure. But no, I, I don't see a voucher con coming anytime <laughs> soon. Yeah, there, which it's I'm not- having the most, the biggest FOMO right now because I yeah, have. Yeah, you and me both. I, this is the first time that I've missed outside of uh, the first year of the pandemic. So, oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, because I've been to, yeah, I've got, well, since I've been going, I think I've been to four. Yeah. Yeah. I, I went last so. year, and I've probably been to four. And I made the decision this year. The only conference I'm doing actually is in Iceland <laughs> in what? November. Oh, oh you're uh, doing the amazing one. Uh, yeah. But I decided like not to do, I normally do Thriller Fest and VoucherCon. And, I didn't have a book out this year, so I'm like, it's just so expensive. It's like, especially Thriller Fest in New York City. It's just it, you know, a couple grand easily yeah. that you'll drop yeah. there. So um, I'm going to my first Thriller Fest actually this next year, and then oh, right I'll be at Altracon. Uh, yeah, I, I my my agent uh, who is in in New York, uh, New York City. She she's like I. I I go every year. I would really love it for you to go out there. So well, yeah, she lives there. It's easy for her to go every year. She just walks on over to the hotel, and it, and it makes it additionally hard because uh, my my husband always comes with me. Um, just it's kind of he's my he's my security blanket. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I do have like pretty bad social anxiety. Once I get into a place, then. I I don't think anybody would ever notice that I get in anxiety, but. Um, right. you know, that's that's what drinks are for. Right? Right. Well, <laughs> what and it's not for. <laughs> and I'm sure you've you experienced through BoucherCon that mystery and thriller writers are the sweetest, gentlest, kindest, oh, yes. most giving people out there. I mean, really, it's yeah. it's so true. I, I've met so many people and created so so much of a network, not only through conferences but through this podcast, and and just so selfless. You know, so yeah. it's 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 an easy crowd to kind of hang out with. Yes, and I and I've I've had so many friends. I remember the first voucher con that I went to. Um, I actually went because Lou Bernie, who was a, a mentor of mine uh, during my my college years, um, he he was like, "You need to go out. You need to. You, this is where you need to go. These these yeah. are your people." Because I had no idea what what kind of book I was writing, right. and and he was like, "Well, it's, it, you're writing mystery. You're writing crime. So you need to be out there, develop, you know, get get network and." I was terrified that first time. Yeah, and then, and then and then you know once I got over that hump, that I was like, okay, like I really probably don't need my husband with me, but he right. loves he he is such a huge reader. He yeah, like he, he has friends there now too. So yeah, it's kind of well, it's it's one of the I don't know if it's a secret or not, but it's something I preach all the time is that you know networking is as important to an author as it is to any other professional in any other industry. And you might go to these sessions and, you know, flip a coin whether you're going to get information that is going to be useful out of the actual panels, but the actual networking events. Um, but those first few times are tough, man, because you're this, because if you're there the first few times, it's usually like either you're not published yet, or you, maybe you have a debut out, mm-hmm. you don't know anybody and there's some big names in the room and you're intimidated. Um, so those first couple of three years, you know, you're kind of like, hey, yeah. can I- I talk to you for five minutes and, but then after a while you're like, Oh, these people are super cool and they will just hang out and they're just a good time. Yeah. I mean, wh- whenever, uh, it was last year, whenever I was nominated for Anthony yeah, and it, that, and that was, you know, after the pandemic, cause my, my book came out here in the heart of the pandemic. So right. trying to do any kind of marketing, it was just really tricky. And, uh, you know, thank goodness for virtual. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it it was it was just like a reunion because just being there last year, it was just so much fun. Like yeah. I don't even know if there'll be a better voucher con for me than that. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and that's a good city. That was a good hotel. That was, it was just great. A lot of good vibes. So much good food too. Yeah. 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 For sure. 
But, so tell me a little bit about growing up in Oklahoma and where kind of your creative sparks. Can you can you look back on your life and be like, oh yeah, I was writing those weird short stories when I was ten. That was that I can trace it back to there. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've been writing, you know, like a lot of people. I, f- I feel like a lot of people kind of have this story. I've been writing since I was a kid, and and I really was. Um, mm-hmm. I my dad was an artist, uh, so for me, I, I my trajectory. I always thought I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to you know be a visual artist like my dad. Mm-hmm. So uh, for me, it was just I'm going to illustrate these books. So I kind of had to make myself write a story with it um so i could have this little books to show my parents or my teachers um and then over the years uh, especially whenever i i I got into you know high school i had a a really great english teacher and you know teachers they it's usually that one person you're like mr mrs whatever (laughs) yeah mrs bradford um so she (laughs) i was i was in the the gifted uh program and and I really didn't know what the heck I was doing in there. Like a lot of the kids were really focused on computers, were like really big at the time. Um, uh, and and I was not interested at all in that. And she's like, you know, I really feel like you're you're a strong writer. And why don't you, um, you know, look at, at, at focusing on, on this and doing some short stories and start submitting to places and you know, get into the writer's club. We didn't even have a writer's club in high school. So I started the writer's club. Oh, that's good. Um, it, the, the writer's block, that's what it was called. Writer's block grew. <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of how I, I got, I got started with actually sending my work out. And I had a few things published, wrote a lot of bad poetry. And so mm-hmm. that, that was like, I was like, I'm going to publish that. Angst filled teenage <laughs> poetry. Oh, oh, you know, a that rhymed. Poetry. <laughs> Tor- Tori Amos, um, oh. know, uh, Fiona Apple, yeah, I, yeah, I was, like all their, um, yeah. Well, that was probably right the sweet spot of uh, their popularity too. Yes, uh, but but yeah, it really I, I had that love for it, but I still did not see that as a career. Like it was, it was my hobby, and yeah. art was still the focus. It wasn't until I I was in uh, college and I. Um, kind of forced myself to go through the visual arts program that I realized I I don't have that passion that I yeah. thought I had for it. And your talents uh, might be different. Right. Yeah. I mean, I saw these people who are just, whoa, really into it. And, yeah. Uh, and and I, I love, I love, I will always love the arts. Um, uh, and I, I love collecting pieces and uh, especially local artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, I had another <laughs> professor in college, uh, Dr. Celia Kadong, and she, she was, she was like, you keep taking all these English courses and lit courses, and and I, I you know, you're you're writing a lot, and I really, I can see that that's a passion for you. Like, why aren't you pursuing this? And so I changed. Two years in, I I completely changed my my major. Um, I had I had a bunch of a uh, uh, mass communication because I, I was I was doing uh. Uh, journalism mm-hmm. uh, at, at first and and it was just so you know restricted and oh yeah <laughs> which <laughs> well, is, which it, is a talent unto great. itself though you learn how to how to tell the story and <laughs> oh yeah you, a, you, a four inch column right yeah there. right and and i think that that really influenced how i write because i'm pretty um uh, you know I, I i like to get to the point really fast i i'm mm. not um uh I, whenever I'm drafting, I, I have pretty, like, I, I start out pretty, uh, on a low end. I say low end, like 85 to me, 85 K is like low end for me. And then I just expand from there. I, I kind of add the pretty on, on mm-hmm. top out, out mm-hmm. later on. And that's, you know, that's, I really feel like that came from journalism. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I started tutoring in English. Uh, so they're international students and, um, learning, like hearing their stories, it just kind of got more. Like I, I was like, I really want to. I there are all these stories that are they're out there, and I, I really want to do something with it. Um, and so that's that's right. kind of I yeah. So I just I, and then I graduated, got married, had a kid, 
And then that stopped for a very long time. Well, sure, sure. I mean, it's, it's an, and you say at the beginning of, of that, that, you know, it's a common story and it is to an extent, but I'm always surprised yeah. by the number of people, including myself, who didn't study it at all, had no interest in it. And I didn't start writing until my, my 30s. And I, I come from a very strong business background, for example. So I, you know, I started writing out of a passion, but then I looked at the business side. I'm like, what a terrible <laughs> career choice this would be for anybody. So it must be very difficult as somebody who's young, maybe starry eyed in college and following uh, his or her passion. And then to say like, well, what, what can I do with this? Like, what, if, what, what are the realities of being a working writer? And the realities are it's pretty fucking harsh. Yeah. It's, Really fucking hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, and you know, uh, it, it's it is it is true. Like once you, once you're in a family situation, it is it is difficult with young children. And I still have, you know, I still have a um, eleven and seventeen year old. Yeah. Um, so you got some time. And, you got some ways yeah, to go. Yeah. My mine yeah, are so just that's... just left the house to college. The youngest one like two weeks ago. So as of oh. two weeks ago, I'm an empty nester. Oh, I am doing the college thing with, with, with my daughter right now. It is so It's a stressful. trip, isn't it? It is. It is. It's so. It's Filling out the FAFSA and, and the, yeah. Yeah. And like looking at the cost of everything, I'm like, it's I need to sell a lot of books. <laughs> right. Right. I, yeah. Right. That's a motivator right there. Um, uh, to, to, you know, my, my kids were both like, I want to go to state school. I'm like, great. Like, oh, but not in this state. I'm like, what? <laughs> It doesn't help me. <laughs> so well, they're I, in Louisiana and Michigan. I'm like, great. Oh, I'm 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 lucky. I say lucky. Um, I'm just glad that my daughter just that she's she's looking at in state. Um, yeah, yeah. Which, makes a I big mean, difference. Yeah, I mean, she, we have like one of the best. Uh, actually, my alma mater, um, Oklahoma City University. It's a it's a private university, and that's where I got my my MFA. That's where Lou Lou Bernie is so mm -hmm. Um, uh. But they have an amazing uh, performing arts program there. Right. They have a, a high number of people who go on to Broadway, and my daughter. Wow! The so that's that what was she was to do. very artistic yeah. family. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kristen Chenoweth. She. she oh. From there. Oh, cool. Yeah. I didn't so know that. Yeah. Um, we've got a, we've, Oklahoma. We have a lot of famous performers. You hmm. know? It's not just Reba. Like we've got you know Garth Brooks. Yeah. We, we've got. Um, Interesting. We've got all ends, so. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so life gets in the way for a little while, but you're, you are who you are. And so, and I, and I've seen this evidenced with almost every one of my guests, like no matter how much somebody tries, maybe not to be a writer, if they are a writer, <laughs> it comes out at some point. It might not come out till they're 70 years old, but it will burrow through the skin at some yeah. point and they will yeah. do something. So at what point where you're like, okay, I need, I need this outlet. So in 2013, my uh, early 2013, my, my father had, had died. Uh, mm. very, he, he died suddenly. Um, and there, was, there were so many things that he wanted to do in life, um, including with, with his artistic abilities. And he just, he never, he just did not pursue it. We, we grew up very poor. Uh, we, I mean, we you, have to, you have to be practical too. You have to yeah, yeah. put food on um, the table. Right, right. I mean, at, at one point in my life, we, we were homeless. Um, mm, wow. So it was like, yeah, practicality was always number one. Um, but after he died, I like I just looked at my life. I had, you know, two kids at that point, a, a, a one who was very young, just toddler still. And I did not want to, I, like, I just thought if I die, like, what, what have I done? Like, right. what did I do? Right. right. It was like one of those. What have I left on this planet for others to <laughs> see, see I, those... that I existed? Yeah. Mid, mid thirties. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> and totally. uh, so there were, there was a local uh, program at a, uh, like an art center and there was a writing the novel uh, kind of thing. Cause I, I had, I had tried many times to get through writing a novel and it was, I had all these short stories and I had, you know, I I had published short stories in the past, but never got to the point of, of long form. I was like, man, I really, I need some, something. 
And so I went to this this place, and that's where I, that was actually the where I learned about the MFA program, the low residency MFA program at uh, Oklahoma City University. And it took me a year though to apply, but I went through and I, I did like the little uh, the little course and learned a lot. And I had started writing on a, on a book, um, started writing on a novel. Uh, and so I, I, I applied and got into the program. And my, my husband was like, you need to go. Like I went to uh, one of the readings before I applied. I went to one of the readings. Lou was one of the readers there. Um, there was a, a lot of amazing readers. Oklahoma uh, Poet Laureate, who mm. used to be the director of the program, Gen- Janetta Calvin-Mish. Um, so... I, I saw the reading and I'm like, shit, yeah. And I was talking with, with the, the students afterwards and they were working parents. I'm like, I can do this. I right. can do this. I mean, it's going to be really expensive, but like, <laughs> I, I, I'm one of those people I kind of like need to have that structure of, of, uh, of being in a program. And I, I did, I learned a lot and I know a lot of people don't come from a MFA, uh, but I, I definitely felt like it was 100% worth it. Um, right. And then I, you know, after I had a book, I had a book, which was Walking Through Needles. Uh, yeah. And. That that, now that book, did that, was that written during the program, prior yeah. to the program? Or was it, was it your dissertation, essentially, or? Yes, it was. It, it was. It was my thesis during the thesis, program. Yeah. And, uh, and it was, uh, a mess. I mean, it was yeah. great. It, like, like all the pieces were there, and and Lou, like he was like, yeah, I think this was really good. And uh, but I I knew once I started going out and querying because that's one thing that a lot of MFA programs are not good. They don't um, go into uh, the the, the, <laughs> yeah, the they're like here you go, figure right. it out on your own. <laughs> right now you have to Google everything else. <laughs> oh, God. that's what I had to do. I didn't know what an yeah. agent even was. Yeah, I. It, so I wrote a lot of horrible query letters mm-hmm. um, and learned a lot through that process uh, and had, uh, you know, so many bites, uh, so, you know, so many asked for fools, but n- I didn't get, I wasn't getting an offer. And it, so I, and then I just kind of put everything on the back burner because my um, 2017, uh, my mother uh, was diagnosed uh, actually on the day the anniversary of my dad, my dad's dad, uh, she was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Oh my goodness. Wow. That's so, really tough. <laughs> so, so it was, it, it was just a, I was, you know, trying to still trying to find an agent. And I remember going to, uh, the Toronto voucher con, mm-hmm. uh, my mom had, had just gone through another surgery and I like the trip was already paid for before we knew about her, uh, diagnosis and I I didn't let it go and my mom was like uh, this is before this is when she still had the ability to speak and she was like no you need to go like you could get you know an agent there and so we went and uh, and it was just like the weirdest kind of experience of right your head's all over the place yeah like it was the it was the worst decision um, and I mm. and I came back and then it was you know shortly after my mom had passed so it, I, I took a long time to get back into querying. I just was like, I'm just going to focus on work and, uh, you know, my day job and, uh, I'll, you know, still writing, still working on things. And then I picked it back up and I did a, a pretty big revision, mm-hmm. um, started querying again, getting rejections again. And then I saw Kelly Garrett, um, you know, Kelly, uh, mm-hmm. Kelly um, she had posted on Facebook about pitch wars because she had mm, yeah. program yeah and the the deadline for it was the next day <laughs> of course so um i whipped together uh, uh like a, a prologue I, i've never done a prologue for a book ever and but i i was having such trouble at the beginning of my book i was like i'm just gonna write a prologue for it and so i did and i got in um Lane Fargo and Hallie Sutton uh, were my mentors for that. And then I went through two months of the mo- the the most intense revision process that I've ever been through. Like 
actually, I feel like that helped me so much before I, mm. you know, was working with a, a publisher, working with an editor, because it felt like nothing afterwards. It's like, okay, we, you've got um, three weeks to do these like minor revisions. <laughs> and I'm like, turning it in the next week. Um, wow. But uh, it was, it was a, a huge learning process. And that's how I got my agent. Yeah. The the pitch wars. And I, that's I, I, amazing. Yeah, I'm sad it's no longer uh, around. Oh, and, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think last year, or maybe the year before was the last year. That that's that's a lot of work for yeah. <laughs> ages to work on. And yeah, that's that's a tough thing to do. So I get that. And yeah, I mean, my agent does, you know, pitch fest and stuff like that. And she's like, it's, it's tough. It's exhausting. And, uh-huh. you know, and just kind of for listeners, just to contextualize, I don't know, you know, there's a lot of aspiring writers who listen the, you know, what you're talking about here, the whole process of querying and going through agents is, you know, the odds of getting an agent are pretty slim, even though you don't pay anything until the agent sells something. And and my agent once told me something to the extent that she gets, she's a, she's a single person entity, uh, you know, 30 to 40 queries a day, and she takes on maybe one person a year. And it's, you know, it's terribly difficult. So to even get an agent without even sold, having sold a book yet is a massive accomplishment that, that, you know, honestly, few people even get that far, which is a shame. Uh, but that's yeah. the reality of, 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 because there's so many people writing out there. Um, and then, and then what was the process? Like you have this agent, yeah, I'm sure you're probably going through maybe some more edits with him or her. Yeah. And, 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 and at some point they start shopping the book. And what was that experience like? Okay, so this is where it gets kind of weird. <laughs> so, um, before uh, b- before doing the the pitch wars, I had um, I had sent my book out to Polis Books, mm-hmm. um, because they take unaged uh, authors, and and I and I think they were like what one of maybe two that I sent out for uh, you know before I had an agent. Mm-hmm. And the day, the day that I got the call that, that I sat down and signed everything with, with my agent, Sandy Lou as a bookworm, uh, I got an email from, with an offer fr- from, from Jason Pinter with Polis <laughs> with an offer. And I was like, Oh my God. Well, there goes 15% right off the top. <laughs> so, so I, I contact, I contacted, uh, you know, I got back with Sandy and we both we both knew that my book was going to be very difficult to it it it's it's a difficult book, mm-hmm. um it's it's got a lot of dark themes uh, and you know on top of the fact that it, you know it's it's dealing with a a, a masochist mm-hmm. <laughs> who uh, gets involved with a um, you know a sadist who is who is uh, um, abusing them uh, um, and 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 a, she's a teenager. Um, so, yeah, we knew it was going to be difficult. Um, and Polis, you know, they they do have a history of taking on some books that that uh, you know kind of push some boundaries. Mm-hmm. And so, I I was like, you know, I feel like this is the right decision go with to go with this publisher rather right. than go on submission. Uh, so I did not have the experience of going on submission until mm-hmm. uh, hurt book. for me until my yeah. second book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was, I was very lucky that it got picked up really, you know, pretty fast. Uh, like, I think like three weeks after we was sent out, we wow. you know, started getting interest. And uh, I had heard so many wonderful things about Amazon publishing. And so it was kind of a no brainer. Like, I, I have so many friends who are like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm making a living uh, doing it because they pay monthly and, hmm. um, yeah, you hit your royalties a lot faster. Uh, so it was like, okay, yeah, I, maybe I could have waited and and we'd see like, you know, the the big five. <laughs> and well, I, one book at a time. I mean, right, right. And and I'm like, right, right now, this they feel like home. They're really mm-hmm. great to work with. Great. I I had an amazing editor and a Charlotte Hersher. Um, and uh, she's worked with a lot of friends that I know too, uh, some who are with Thomas and Mercer. Yeah. Uh, 
And that's kind of the funny thing. A lot of people think because of the nature of, of what I write, since I write darker things and, uh, uh, and it's, you know, involving pink, it's, you know, a lot of mm-hmm. positive, uh, uh, situations, uh, they just assumed that I was with Thomas and Mercer and I'm like, no, I went to Montlake. So, uh, and that, now, now Montlake is their kind of more romance themed imprint. Is that I'm trying yeah. to remember. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But they, but they do have, uh, you know, they do have authors who write on the, the darker side of, of that. So, right. Whereas uh, Thomas and Mercer might be your more traditional okay. thrillers, right. Mystery, that kind of a thing. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so it was it was kind of, it was interesting, like getting to know the, some of my fellow Montlake authors because a lot of them, you know, write these really like cozy romances, uh, rom coms, <laughs> and like, <laughs> and and you know, I've like, got like mm-hmm. a single, I've got like a single mom dominatrix. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's it's all about it's the story ultimately. Like as long as you know, it's I I find it. I was reading a couple of the interviews you did and stuff like that, and I just you know. I read about what you write about. I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't re- have any kind of weird, like I, cause I read so many different types of things. I'm like, yeah, that's the protagonist and this is what they do. And that's interesting because it's different than what maybe I'm used to reading, but it yeah. doesn't strike me as like, oh, this is taboo. But, but I know that that's the reality of the situation. I know it also changes yeah. over time. Um, but it's it just it's always fascinating to me. I mean, I think you're you're well poised to, to have a book band, which would be the most awesome thing in the world. I would love that. I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah, in no, me too. <laughs> I'm in Oklahoma. I'm surprised that my first book is in the in libraries here. Yeah, right, right. Not in the children's <laughs> they, section. <laughs> they they haven't caught it yet. Yeah. <laughs> but it's but, just it's just it's just so interesting to me the times we're in right now and the views on books and like to, to me, they're all just, they're all just stories. And the more innovative and the more interesting the protagonist is, however you want to define that, um, the more it's going to stand out and it has nothing to do with that. Especially because you talk about, you know, kink positive you're, you're it's, it, there's no, there's no light on this. That's like, okay, this is not, a good thing by any stretch of the minute. You're like, no, th- these are people and th- this is what they believe in. And this is, you know, this is enhancing their lives and those that they love. Who the fuck cares? You know? Right. Right. I mean, for me, it, the, the whole reason why I, you know, I kind of, <laughs> kind of, I guess, establishing this brand of, of that kink uh, positivity is because I, I'm a part of that community mm-hmm. and, and I was really getting tired of reading books that were, you know, if, if somebody was into key, uh, if they were, you know, into, especially like if they were into giving pain or, or, uh, even sometimes receiving pain, they, they, it was just looked at as, oh, you know, they're, they're the villain. So obviously. And, and, yeah, that's, yeah. Or, or, you know, sometimes I, I've read some books where, uh, people were trying to to show it in a normalized fashion, uh, but I could tell um, that they that they don't that they weren't in that world. You know yeah. that maybe they didn't do as the research that that they could have done. I mean, it's kind of like reading a book uh, by an author who doesn't have kids, and they're writing a protagonist who does. And yeah, like, it is weirdly <laughs> obvious, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm like, You're like no. why are you speaking so formally to your child? <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> why are you not pulling your hair out right now <laughs> yeah no it, it's it's a weird thing too because you can write it from the, the 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 perspective of somebody who's part of that community and be completely like this is how it is with what whatever you shades you want on it that are all truthful and people will still absorb it however they're through their own lens of how they grew up and their own, you know, sexual experiences and things like that. And, you know, it is, I guess it could be kind of triggering just because sex in general is, is triggering. Like for, for whatever reasons for individual people, people have reactions to that. You know, and when I, I don't write a lot of sex, I I have nothing against it. I think there's, I, I, I'm sex and violence to me are very much like, I think they're important. (laughs) I think they should be treated 
very carefully. I think they were treated very respectfully. And and if you're going to write those scenes in the book, it, they need to matter. They need to right. propel the story. Right. They need to be meaningful. And, and it doesn't matter what form it takes. I mean, I've written the most horrifically violent things, but it served a purpose. Um, but it's not. But I wouldn't do it every chapter <laughs> because because right, right. it's gratuitous. So it it just it's all building character and building story, whatever those devices are. Right, right. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people who will you know go into reading hurt for me are going to think there's just going to be sex on every other page. Um, but it but it's very much like that. Just uh, like you know placing any type of sex scene so that it makes sense for the characters it, it, it it's part of the plot it's not just okay time to have sex um because right. yeah i mean that that is that's that's always something i'm i'm aware of because i i have read you know plenty of books I, I read you know i've read i read widely i read a yeah. uh, erotica too sure um and it's yeah, like it gets it gets a little too much, and then it doesn't matter. The emotional connection is not there, um, and that's right. that's always important to me whenever I'm writing about sex or about violence. Right, uh, right, and that's and there's a lot of violence in it. <laughs> yeah, totally, and that's where the publisher comes in. And so I'm looking right now at your book cover right behind you, and I'm like, that's a thriller. I look at that book cover. That's a thriller book cover. Um, I have plenty of experience, and we go through and. and <laughs> So they're trying to say position as like, this isn't necessarily erotica. This isn't uh, certainly not romance. This is a thriller, um, but it's got these different angles in it. But, but that's, a, that's a, that's a struggle, right? Is that you have two or three seconds of somebody's attention as they're scrolling through their phone, looking at book covers, maybe flipping it to see the back cover of the, the, the back cover copy to <laughs> try to convince them or you know, relate to them, everything you just talked about, all the feelings you had writing the book, kind of the nuances, it's got to be distilled in two paragraphs on a cover for somebody to to make that purchase decision. That's, that's tough to do. Yeah, it is. And, and especially, you know, because a lot of, you know, people, uh, as, as you know, a lot of people assume that authors have a more control than what they have over right how a book is positioned, how it's marketed. Um, I will say Amazon did, you know, they, they definitely uh, let me put quite a bit of input in what I wanted. Um, and uh, I, I was, I was really happy for that because I, I, I didn't want it to be overtly sexual right. um, on, on the cover, but I wanted to have that mystery. I wanted to have that kind of dwarf vibe. Um, and I think they, they did a great job. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's and it, and the other part of that is the title, right? I don't know if yeah. that was your original title it or not. My original title, which yes. is which is rare, which is an awesome title. But the beauty of that title, "Hurt for Me," is that because you have the word "hurt" in there, you don't have to have such a dark uh, context in the visual aspect of the cover because it's already covered by that word. So, right. so it doesn't look. It says hurt, but it doesn't look like this is going to be disturbing. This is this is intriguing, um, especially with the work with the shadows and stuff like that. So it's yeah. it, it's such a it's such an art and a science. And I'm always fascinated, yeah. you know. And you see, you had a lot of input, which is fantastic. And I'm given the same, but a lot of times I'm just like, this is what you all do. <laughs> you are experts <laughs> yeah. at this. I'm not, so I will I will give input, but. I'm going to lean and with titles, they, they will, they will go through, they will test title after title and I might give them 40 titles and they'll test them all. And they'll say, this is the one that came out the top. I'm like, I don't even like that title, but if it tested the best, who am I to argue against, it? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, I, of titles like that. I, for me, and I don't know if, if this is how, how you work as well. Um, I, I know quite a few friends who, who work this way, but they, like cannot write without having a title. Like I was talking to Sha Sean Cosby. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about that and just like, like gotta ha have that. Um, it's just hard. It's hard for me to get started on something. Uh, the uh, book I'm working on right now, uh, it went through. I don't even know, like 20, 20 titles before I could, I, I kind of, I went on to one and then I felt like I could actually write the book. Right. Right. <laughs> like I was, I was working on No, it, I'm the same like, way. Uh. Yeah. You got to treat it like, like your buddy and you're in war together and you're like, 
you're probably not going to be here at the end, but <laughs> we'll, right. we'll go through, we'll go through this together and see what happens. But I, so I'll, I, I will title something and then I will immediately, as I'm writing, I will list like maybe 20 other titles because I know I'm going to be asked for those. And like what I just sent my agent right now, I love the title, but it's also the title of another book in the thriller category from like six or seven years ago. So it might not even be relevant, but I'm like, I love this title, but I'm, I know that it's maybe a 50% chance it'll stay. So but you just got to let it go. That's actually one of the first things I do whenever I, I have a title in my head that I love is that I, I go through and I'm like, okay, are there any other books by this title? Yeah. And if there if there are, then I will, you know, I, I try to do the whole, like, flip some words around. And yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's so, like, my my recent release, The New Neighbor, was not my working title, and the publisher came out with that. I'm like, yeah, but there's another book coming out within two months, also called The New Neighbor, and it's in that whole kind of mystery, thriller, suspense genre, um, but they figured that it was fine enough. I'm like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you know, and then <laughs> then there's like confusion on Goodreads and you got to get it corrected and, you know, that kind of a thing. But uh, it, I, yeah. I guess it just doesn't, you know, unless it's such a, you know, you can name something Catch-22, for example, something right, that, that's right. so iconic or so specific of a name. But yeah, so that's interesting. So now you're going to go, so you're January, right, is your release? I, you know, I am February 1st. Okay. Now. I, um, I, I'm April with my next one. So, but now, but now, but now you can do in-person stuff. Um, yeah. You know, so it's, it makes a big difference. And I don't know if, you know, if you're going, if, if Amazon's going to put you on any kind of tour, which is pretty rare. Um, and a lot, and a lot, and a lot of authors will pay for their own, um, tours, which obviously gets <laughs> crazy expensive. Yeah. And I've done that, and I've not done that as well over the course of nine books, just to see like what works, what doesn't yeah. work, and you can't, you can't tell. So, but I think it's good to get out there as much as you can. But it's, but there's a cost it's, associated it's with all that. Um, with that, that is one thing that I, I am learning. Uh, there, there's a there's such a big difference uh, coming from an indie publisher like Polis to Amazon, which, you know with my local bookstores, all those connections, um, they're kind of like the enemy, right? So <laughs> it is interesting. Yeah. So, so having in-person events is that I'm, I am learning that that's a, a little tricky. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely working on that. I'm probably going to be doing more virtual events, uh, because sure. of that. Uh, but I, but I, there are, there are some, some bookstores that are, uh, you know they're they're kind of willing to to give the Amazon books, especially if it's a local author. I'm like, come on now, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the other thing that people do, which is I think good to do, regardless of who your publisher is, is to do in conversation events. Um, and if you have another author there who's maybe not an Amazon, and and they can bring their own draw in for their own books. Um, that might be a little bit easier of a sell to a to an independent bookseller. Um, and then the events, I think, are a lot more entertaining for for the audience because you have two interesting people rather yeah. than all the, especially somebody who might have a little bit of social anxiety to stand. You know, that's one of the biggest struggles of authors in general, I find, uh, is just like promoting yourself is just, it's an uncomfortable, awkward thing that, um not many people are good at, and it's and it takes a while to get there. And if you're not comfortable doing that, um, it can be really torturous. I am learning the power of Instagram. Uh, mm -hmm. I I think I'm too old for TikTok at this point. I, you're not. I I've tried. <laughs> I'm on TikTok, and I'm sure I'm older than you. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be 44. Um, oh, I'm 53. Yeah, so. <laughs> Okay. Well now, well now I've got to do it. And, um, but, but I put like yeah. clips of this show on TikTok and you know, you, re you can repurpose content um, very easily. And rather than be like, Hey, this is what I had for dinner. Like I don't do that shit. Um, but yeah. you can, if you write a newsletter, you could repurpose some of that and make it into a, a quick TikTok video. It, it takes time and it takes effort, but, yeah. but it can be done. <laughs> I, I am posting more on there for sure. Um, you know, I've, I've been trying to get my my daughter to give me a tutorial because uh, I, I me and technology, it, it takes me a while. <laughs> you can also but hire people overseas, <laughs> swear to God, who will do great stuff for you, not very expensively. And, and it's it's pretty amazing. 
I might have to look into yeah. that. But but yeah. yeah, I'm definitely I'm connecting with more of the the bookstagram folks, and I'm doing a tour with that with oh. the folks. Um, right. So and and really like yeah, doing doing the book tours like doing that kind of Instagram book tours, it's really not that much. Uh, and like, I, I actually, I've got quite a few books that I need to send out. So now that I've got my, my arcs, I, I've got, I've got a lot to put together to mail those out. And I've got some like fun, you know, marketing things yep. uh, that I've been creating with that. So yeah, it's, but as far as like the, the you know, virtual events, of course. Yeah. I had, I was really lucky that I, I did one with Sean for, uh, oh. Uh, That's great. My debut. Yeah. Um, I was uh, at uh, through Magic City Books in, in Tulsa. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Mm -hmm. They are an amazing, mm -hmm. amazing bookstore. Um, they have big names. Uh, like like they're right now they're they're uh, gonna they're about to do um, uh, an in person event with Rachel Maddow. Mm -hmm. wow. uh, like, That's cool. You know they've got they they've had they've had. Uh, um, Matthew McConaughey, like wow. uh, he actually he actually read my question on air when he was on there. It was a bit. I was That's like, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I definitely plan on doing that uh, because this is such a sort of like a feminist, sexy book. Um, I'm I'm probably gonna do you know some type of an event with uh, probably Lane and Hallie. We've kind of we've talked mm -hmm. about that because they they both are in that that feminist uh vibe with their with their books um uh but but yeah like i'm i'm just gonna i'm gonna put myself out there as much as possible yeah it's, totally the, the anxiety always gets better over time I, I think it's one of those things that a lot of people if you're out there listening uh you know you just have to kind of do it and and get over that hump and the, yeah. the more you do it the more comfortable you get right it's like anything, right? Yeah. You cannot, writers can no longer, novelists can no longer just be like, I write the book and I don't do anything yeah. else. You have to be a team player. There's a lot you have to do. But I think it's also important. And I've been told this. And so now I preach it when I teach <laughs> is like, you don't have to do everything. You find what you're good at, find what you oh. like to do or that you hate the least <laughs> and just do that. And so for me, for example, like my newsletters, I'm like, I'm dedicated. I put, you know, there'll be three to 5,000 word newsletters. But I might do a lot less on Facebook and Instagram or whatever. Yeah, you, know, you find that thing, and yeah, and, and it makes a difference. And you have great, you have a, a great newsletter. Like, oh, thank got, you. You've got you've got really great content. So, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I put yeah. a lot of time into it, and I always hate. I don't hate doing them, but I'm like, oh god damn it, I got to run my fucking newsletter. But then I do it. I'm like, okay, I'm glad I did that. And and then again, you'll find stuff to repurpose. So you know, that's all of a sudden a blog on my website. It's on the RSS feed, so that's going on Amazon and on Goodreads, and you can really get a lot of mileage out of it. Um, but you just have to you have yeah. to be you have to be organized, which is not something all authors are good at doing. <laughs> I think we're a little disorganized by nature. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a reason why you're not seeing anything else in this office. <laughs> right, right, right. Don't pan the camera around. No, <laughs> that's funny. Well, my husband's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like setting everything up. I'm trying to look professional. <laughs> this one little corner of the room. All right, Heather. We're going to wrap up before we do. We're going to do a quick storytelling. Oh um, God, I forgot about that. No, you can't forget about that. <laughs> I have to do it every time. I do it. All right. All right. <laughs> so I've right. chosen three books kind of at random off of my bookshelves, and you're going to choose one of those books, and we're going to pick a random page and a random sentence. I'm going to read that sentence, and that's going to be the first sentence and maybe a two-minute long short story. So I'll read that sentence. Okay. You give me the next sentence or two. I'll go, and then we'll see what a shit show it turns into. Um, I have Out of the Ashes by Maisie Mosco. Uh, Stolen Things by R.H. Heron. And Emily Little John's A Season to Lie. Uh, so I think all three female authors. Um, so choose one of those. Um, I'll go with the second. Yeah. Stolen Things. Oh. Rachel Heron, R. H. Heron. Um, now give me a page between one and uh three fifty. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Pick a good uh, one. Fifty two. Fifty two. Oh. oh. <laughs> I have a guitar teacher who once told me like 52 was a spiritual meaningful number. Like anything divided by any uh, clean division of 26. I'm like, oh, okay. 
he killed himself, unfortunately. That's totally why I chose that. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, oh, I'm going to, this is a very simple sentence and it's just right. a question. And it's an eternal, eternal thought. What had she done? And I and I can go first if you want. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. You go first. <laughs> what had she done? She stared down at the floor, her hand still shaking. She didn't remember dropping the knife, but there it sat on the floor, clean and slick, the blood still bright. What had she done? She could hear the car pulling up outside the kids getting out of the car running to the house their giggles getting closer and closer Mm -hmm. she only had a moment to get the knife queen (laughs) this was way harder than I thought it was going to be she Um, I'll go. So she um, she couldn't believe that she had spent a year planning this, and she ended up acting in passion. It was going to be the perfect crime. She had done all her research on the library internet. Nothing could be traced to her. And yet in a moment of weakness, she snapped. The door knocked, and she realized she had left it locked. Her eight-year-old was pounding on the door. Mommy, what are you doing? (laughs) Mommy, open the door. Her heart thundered in her ears. She could barely breathe, knowing that this was going to be the end of everything, everything that she had worked so hard for. Everything that she had done up until this moment, gone, her children would know the monster that she is, the monster she's always been. There was no question that she wasn't legally going to get out of this. The only question was whether or not her kids would still love her. Her focus had to be on only one thing, convincing both of her kids not what a monster she was, but what a monster he had been. We can call it there. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that, that, that feels like, yeah, that's like. That's good. So <laughs> you got the emotion in there because she cares about the kids. And yeah. What would you do? So it, it's funny when you say, I can't do this because I'm. Uh, so I, I have an injured hand right now. And so it's wrapped up for a couple of weeks. So for two weeks, I can't use my right hand. And and I'm learning like, oh, I can get, I can still get things done pretty well. But then you sit down to write and you realize you're really, your real option is voice to text, is dictation. And I started to realize that as many times as I, I've done this impromptu storytelling, that the way that I think, the way that I speak a paragraph that I'm coming up with on the spot is totally different than the way that I would write a paragraph when I would, that I would type it. And it's so much more structured, even if maybe it's almost at the same speed, but it's just, it's a different end result. And it's so weird. It's so weird. And and I, I interviewed Maureen Johnson. And when we got to this part, she's like, I literally can't do this unless I'm physically hitting keys on a keyboard. Yeah. My brain just does it. And I didn't, I'm like, that's crazy. And then now that my hand got hurt, I'm like, I totally get what you mean. <laughs> it's just so strange. I mean, y- you are amazing at this for real. Um, but yeah, that is exactly how, how I write. I, uh, you know, and I, and I have people who they're like, I, I have to write everything out like by hand. I'm like, I cannot do that. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy to me. <laughs> um, but <laughs> But yeah, I I can't imagine just having to do, to do the and and I, I actually have to think about that because um, I don't know I don't know if you like found this in your research or whatnot, but I have uh, rheumatoid arthritis 
Oh, and and it uh, it affects my hands quite a bit. And there are some days where I I do have trouble typing and using my hands. Um, and I think about that because I have friends who uh, who do write and who who have that condition, and they kind of sometimes have to do that. Yeah, oh, it's my. it's. I mean, I only have to do it for two weeks, so it's like I'm not getting into the depth so much that I'm I'm really getting over any kind of a hump. So to me, it's just a constant right. source of frustration. But I can see how you adapt to it. Um, I have a I have a neighbor who lost his fingers and toes to a, a bacterial infection, and and I'm like, all right, <laughs> I'm not complaining about anything because he's right. figured that shit out. And it just it just takes time, and it you you train your brain differently, and maybe you end up you know, having kind of a new kind of fountain of creativity that comes from a place that, that you hadn't had before because you're exercising a part of your brain that you didn't have to. Um, yeah, so it's, it, it's all true. interesting. But um, one of the reasons I had the hand surgery was to prevent long-term arthritis because that's how I feel. I'm like, you know, um, I, I want to, I'd rather take the hit now for short term and, yeah. and ho- hopefully prolong that. So I, I, I empathize with your situation. Yeah, I, but but that that is interesting. Like just that uh, tapping into and 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 maybe that's something to do. Uh, you know, maybe that's something writers can do if they do hit a block. That would be an interesting. I've never thought about that. Like doing that as like an exercise. Yeah, totally. To- well, it's almost like the, how they say it. I never do this because I'm too lazy. But to read your own work out loud as you're editing because you catch so many more things, and it's totally true. You don't, oh wait! You say you don't do that? I don't do that. I'm not not. I'll do it maybe for a chapter. But it's funny when I go to like if, if I'm being asked to 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 do a reading, for example, and they yeah. say you five minutes, and so I have a passage that I like, but it happens to be eight minutes, and I need to cut it down. As I'm reading out loud, I'm like, this is terrible. And then as I edit it, I'm like, why didn't I just write like this to begin with? It's so much better. But you catch so much stuff as you're reading out loud. But I just don't have the patience to do, you know. An uh, eighty-five thousand word manuscript, reading out loud. I have to. I have to. Oh, you have to. Yeah, everyone's yeah, different. Sure. Well, listen. Congratulations on your upcoming release. I'm excited for it, and I'm excited to see you at uh, next year's Thriller Fest and uh, BoucherCon as well. Yes. I will. I'm, I, I'm putting them on my calendar. I'm going to try to get the early bird discounts and and really commit to being there. So, um, yes, but we'll so get a chance to hang out a little bit. This has been so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, Heather. So great talking to you. Great talking to you. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> so that's it. That is my conversation with Heather Levy. Um, and I thought she did just damn fine on the storytelling. Um, she was a little she was a little apprehensive at first, but then she uh, pulled it off quite well. That was going to be a deliciously dark tale. Uh, we could have kept going on that one for a while, I think. Um, so, hey. Check out her new book when it comes out in February 2024. It's called Hurt For Me. I would plug her website, but I could not find one. I'm sure it exists, but I did really look. Um, But she definitely has a presence on social media. Um, So you can look for her there. And you can go ahead and look for me while you're at it. Uh, On all my social media sites and my website at carterwilson.com. That is it for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Making It Up. She was a fun person to talk to. I loved our conversation. More episodes coming out soon. Uh, Thanks, as always, for watching and or listening. Take care.